Kingdom Hearts 3 has bosses, and a lot of them. Well, it, it does have less than other games in the series, but it still is quite a bit. It is an action RPG after all, and there's a decent amount to say about that, which I'm sure you can decipher from the timestamp below. So let's not waste any more time and get into the ranking, shall we? Well, 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 no. We do have to waste a bit of time and set up a few rules. First, no gummy shit bosses because I don't want to talk about them. They'd all be very close to the bottom anyway, and they're all basically the same. You, they just shoot you, and you gotta dodge, and you gotta shoot them back. That, that, that's that's it. That's the entire fight. Um, no data fights or Yuzora. I will be talking about the data fights in Yuzora and ranking them um, in a separate video in probably a few months or so. But yeah, I also wanted to give a little bit of a background on my opinion of KH3 as a whole. Kingdom Hearts 3 is not only my favorite video my favorite game in the Kingdom Hearts series, but my fourth favorite game of all time, followed closely with Kingdom Hearts 1 being my fifth favorite game. I know I never said Kingdom Hearts 2, because while I love Kingdom Hearts 2 to death, it is my personal least favorite of the three numbered titles. 358 Over Two Days, Dream Drought Distance, Birth by Sleep, and Melody of Memory are also some of my favorite games, and really the only Kingdom Hearts games I don't like are Recoded and Union Cross, though admittedly I haven't played Union Cross and instead opted to do a cutscene marathon at a heightened speed. I am also in the middle of playing through Dark Road, so I'm not the biggest expert on the series, but I am a massive fan and do know quite a bit. In fact, I think I'm losing a lot of brain space trying to keep up with all the lore. But that, that's enough rambling. On to the list. That's right, Lunkheads. Pete's invincible! I don't know if the Chaos Carriage even counts as a boss fight, since the Chaos Carriage does appear later in the world as a basic enemy, but the version you fight is three of them combined, which seems like a boss to me. Also, I just want to complain about this thing because the Chaos, the Force Chaos Carriage encounter is one of my least favorite parts of Kingdom of Corona. The sequence where you're forced to fight it just takes so damn long. You take out the two health bars and think it's over, but nope, you have to do the exact same thing again, but two more times. And it's not like this thing is peak enemy design either, it sort of just walks around before charging at you, and that's kinda it. It's unbelievably boring because the only challenge is that you might need to pause the game to yawn. I don't know, like I said, I'm not sure this, if this should have even been included, I mean the wiki doesn't list it as a boss, so this might be pointless, but the whole encounter has the era of a boss fight, so congrats Chaos Carriage, your last place on a list you might not even belong on. The only good thing about this fight is the Rowdy Rumble remix. Musical for everyone to have a lot of finny fun. Only saved from last because of the horse with wheels, we have the lightning angler. I mean, what do I say? Every time you fight it, you get your mind wiped because this heartless boss is so forgettable. Like yeah, it's definitely attacking me, but none of the moves really stick out in my mind as particularly threatening or fun to interact with. He has this lightning attack, the only thing that justifies the first warning in its name, where you just have to block a couple times and that's it. You might end up getting hit by it since your eyes start to glaze over, but there's not a lot to this oversized cheap cheap. Not to mention that it takes place after a much more memorable heartless boss that I'll be talking about in a bit. At least you get the aerial heartbinder afterward, which might be my most used KH3 summon alongside Stitch. Farewell. Next is the UFO from Toy Box, or at least I think that's what it's called. I could not find an official name for this thing to save my life. Also, yeah, the UFO probably shouldn't count as, as well because it doesn't have a traditional health bar and just runs away, never attacking you, but you are draining some sort of bar to take down an enemy, and it's a big enemy, and if, when you take down that enemy, the encounter ends, so... I think it counts. And yeah, the UFO sucks ass. Like I mentioned previously, it just runs away like a bunny when it sees my anti-bunny machine. This is incredibly annoying for many reasons. The only reason it's even this high to begin with is because I like the story reason we're bludgeoning the spacecraft. The aliens being caught by an evil claw is a nice reference. Also, is this thing a heartless or not? It has the heartless emblem, but it just disappears when it's defeated and it doesn't release a heart when killed, so... I don't know this thing's deal. What is with toy box and spaceship enemies? We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Oh, I know we'll meet again some sunny day. 
We have to fight two dark sides in Cage 3, and that kinda appalls me. One in the tutorial, and if you don't count the data fights in Yazora, the third to last fight in Remind, which is kinda insulting. They just placed the tutorial boss, upgraded its HP, and plopped it at the end of Scala Ed Kylum. At least both of these encounters are based on a good boss from KH1, but both basically have zero new moves. I do like the tutorial Darkseid's watery design, so that's something I guess. And I think Darkseid is a much better tutorial boss than one of the final ones, so the Remind fight will take 37th, and the tutorial Darkseid will take 36. That was his mistake! Dark Baymax is definitely a fight in Kingdom Hearts 3. I guess it's a good thing that we have somewhat of a free roamy fight in San Francisco since the place is so damn big, but you just ride around on Baymax for a couple of minutes, holding the R2 button to shoot the edgy one, and occasionally punching back projectiles. You then actually start having control over your movement in the second part of the fight, and yeah, the Baymax controls aren't the greatest for a boss. They're fine when they're a temporary form change in the middle of a mob battle, but when you actually need strict timing, everything just feels super clunky. And because of this clunkiness, they made the boss unbelievably easy so you don't have to struggle with this bad control scheme too much. So it's kinda a lose-lose situation, cause now it's boring, but if they didn't make it boring, it'd be super frustrating. I also never really enjoyed the story context for Dark Baymax. I think bringing the original Baymax back and having it be corrupted is kind of interesting as a concept, but it's just not super interesting in practice. But I do like the design of Dark Baymax, the use of dark cubes in the fight is interesting, and fighting Disney characters in Cage Tree is always a good thing, even if this guy is technically made up by the series. I also enjoy the concept of Baymax's chip acting as his heart, and it plays into the whole what is a heart thing I think the Kingdom Hearts series is going to be focusing on in the future. But hey, let's be constructive. Instead of just complaining at a lackluster boss, why not try to improve it? So let's start a new segment, let's fix a lackluster boss fight into something more cool and epic. Have the original Baymax be corrupted by the alternate realm thing we see in Big Hero 6's Endgame, and Dark Riku corrupts them further with Darkness and traps Sora, Donald, Goofy, and the new Baymax in that dimension. Have them fight Dark Baymax on crumbling buildings that you have to air step between, have Dark Baymax throw buildings at you, use most of his attacks from his actual fight, and make him teleport in on you and such. Just this one-time boss arena I think would make this boss way more interesting. Also, let's mention the elephant in the room, Dark Riku himself. Dark, Dark Riku is my least favorite member of the real organization by far, and he might be my least organization member in general. I'm not 100% sure about that since Zaldin and Lexius give him stiff competition, but the fact that he's just Riku Replica when Riku Replica is already in Kingdom Hearts 3 and there's already Riku in Kingdom Hearts 3 is just annoying. Demix's spot shouldn't have gotten sto stolen by this edgy bastard. The word culture kind of rhymes with vulture, so I don't really like it. I've just been calling it a cult. Oh, the raging vulture. I like a lot about you. I think jumping between beetles high up in the sky is a really fun atmosphere. I like the idea of climbing on a giant bird's back to fight it. I think I like grinding on this multicolored smoke, but this fight just takes way too damn long. It has way too much health for what it is, and the part where you're actually on its back is so mindless, I genuinely think I could do it with my eyes closed, just paying attention to sound cues. I like the Raging Vulture's design, I think it, I like how it feels like a Pirates of the Caribbean themed Heartless, and and again, soaring high above the ocean is a great atmosphere, but atmosphere isn't everything, and the mechanics of this fight sometimes make me want to rip my hair out by how boring they are. Just let it gun just let us gun it down on the beetles once, and then attack it on its back once, and we'll be and it it'd be fine. But it takes way too long as it is, and I don't find it particularly fun or engaging. I'm the real one. I'm really, really done with the Demon Towers. They're just not that interesting. The only reason they're even this high up is because you play as Riku in both fights, and the second one has Anti-Aqua appear to throw it an attack every once in a while. I know the Demon Towers, and especially the Demon Tide, are super powerful enemies. I mean, the Demon Tide killed every Guardian of Light, but I just don't buy it. Like, yeah, that's a lot of Heartless, but they're just shadows. I don't really see how this is supposed to be threatening. The actual fights are fine, I guess. You get to team up with Mickey for some reaction commands, and I enjoy, and I enjoy how Riku plays, but eh. Some say Kai, but the meaning is the same. 
Dark Inferno Key or Kai or whatever. Yeah, this is the Remind version of Dark Inferno, and spoiler alert, the original Dark Inferno is pretty high on this list. So what, what makes the version you're forced to fight in the DLC so mediocre? Well, it, it, it's piss easy now. The original Dark Inferno had me really think how I was going to attack it, how I was going to block its attacks, when it was the right time to heal and such, but Dark Inferno Key? Yeah, just hit, hit it a bunch, I don't know. It's got way less health, it never powers up, it's just boring now. It takes all my problems with the original Dark Inferno, which I'll get to in a bit, and then gets rid of everything I, I actually liked. Thanks. What killed the dinosaurs? The Catastrophe of Chorus. I, I think that's how you pronounce it. it. It's it's fine. It's probably the most forgettable heartless boss in the game for me besides the Lightning Angler because it just doesn't really do anything. It's kind of cute how it acts like a dog in the second phase where he scales the building. Well, not really scale, but more so teleport. is fun because you have to actually chase it. And it's got a pretty fun design. It's just not challenging at all, and it really doesn't leave an impression. They reuse it for a battle gate, and I still don't remember it that well. I'd rather we just skip the formalities. Technically, we have our first organization fight at number 29, which sounds like I'm going to be hunted down and killed, but it's really just a mode of transportation we're ranking here. It's Luxord's ship. The main reason this fight is up so high is the race portion, which I'm also including because I want to, and the story context. If you don't want to hear my opinion on Luxord as a character, you better plug your ears because Luxord is my favorite member of the real organization. Yes, I like him more than Saix, Xion, and especially Dark Riku. I don't like him more than Axel, which is why he isn't my favorite organization member in general, but I love Luxord, and I love his role in the Caribbean in Kingdom Hearts 3. In Kingdom Hearts 2, he doesn't really do anything. He does the whole parley thing with Jack, but he continues that here in a far more interesting way. That's why this boss is this high. It's cool to interact with an organization member for an extended period of time, which KH3 does a decent amount of in worlds like Monstropolis, Toy Box, and San Francisco. Much more than KH2, which really only does it in Beast Castle with Zoldan. I am completely losing my point. But yeah, I love Luxord and his role in the Caribbean. And I like the story reasons this boss takes place, the actual boss fight itself isn't great, but I wouldn't call it abysmal. The race can be somewhat fun since Luxord spawns a bunch of heartless ships to attack you, and the actual fight with the ship is okay, I guess. It's just another ship battle in the Caribbean, which is a combat style I enjoy, just not for a super intended, extended a period of time. When you're aiming for weak points on heartless ships and taking them down in one shot, it's fun, but here it's a bit tedious. You then end the encounter with a mob fight, which is fine, there's a great amount of enemies to take out on Luxord's ship, but it's the, not the greatest end to a boss fight I've ever seen. Also, this has nothing to do with the fight, but I love the moment where Jack destroys Luxord, a literal time wizard. Yeah, they're dark, they're cubes. I call them like I see them. The Dark Cubes. I'm honestly very mixed on them. They have a really cool design, and it's a pretty cool extension of the Microbots from the Big Hero 6 film, but the actual fight is kinda meh. The attacks it does are interesting, I like running around in this mess of Dark Cubes, but it just doesn't have enough health to really last that long. Technically you fight the Dark Cubes twice, but in the, in the first encounter you can't damage it at all, so I'm not including it here. You also run around the city and, fight Big, and free the Big Hero 6 from the Dark Cubes, which is a very fun sequence, actually forcing you to use magic on the environment, flow motion moves, I absolutely love this part of the world. But it's not a boss fight, so it's also not included. This fight is decent. I like the atmosphere of being in Dark Cube Hell, and again, its attacks are cool, but it lets it it lets it you wail on it for too long in between them. Also, the name Dark Cubes is one of the worst names for a Heartless I've ever seen in my entire life. Thanks, Fred. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Why the hell did I place this one so high? At 27, we have the Kraken, one of the most gimmicky fights in the series. I can't help but really enjoy it though. It's not deep 
at all. The Kraken doesn't attack you at all and just holds up its tentacles to block. But look at this atmosphere. You're inside a raging whirlpool fighting the Kraken from the Pirates of the Caribbean. That's gotta count for something, right? Like I said with the Raging Vulture, atmosphere isn't everything, but I actually quite enjoy the game mechanics here. Attacking the Dutchman before we're gonna attack the Black Pearl, frantically multitasking, trying to find where the ship disappeared to while also trying to wail on this tentacle beast. I shouldn't have called it that, but yeah, I just feel really hectic in this fight, due to the drowning atmosphere and interesting gameplay. It's nothing mind-blowing, but I've always had a decent time with it. The Raging Cannon's command is so satisfying to shred its health with too. Look at that! And I know you like that combo on combo action. The Titans are going to be all over this ranking, so let's start with my least favorite, the Ice and Lava Titans. They might be a bit too high, honestly, because all they really do is protect their precious tower, which is actually Zeus cosplaying as a rock mount. But I don't know, the Ice and Lava Titans are huge and pretty imposing, and I like fighting Disney bosses, something Cage 3 doesn't let you do too often. Even if the Titans aren't the most iconic of Disney villains, they pretty much just throw up on you with either Ice or Lava, and the Lava Titan likes to smack you a bit, and the ice kite and creating spikes for you to dodge. It's not the most engaging thing in the world, but it makes it makes good use of air stepping when the uh, oh yeah, the Tornado Titan's here for some reason. But it seems like he's taking classes on how to be an annoying asshole because all he does is blow air to knock you back. You also can't attack him, which, so it's kind of rude he's even intruding since he'll get, his, he'll get the spotlight very soon. I also like how both the Ice and Lava Titans are weak to the two forms of magic you have at the moment, Water and Fire. That's a neat touch. I do wish they moved around a bit instead of just standing there, but what can you really do? That's the doll that big fed me! Angelic Amber, the mid-boss of Toy Box, and my favorite of the Heartless mid-bosses, which is a strangely specific thing, I'm aware. Um, but I'm talking about, like, Catastrochorus and Dark Cubes in San, Fr in San Francisco, the Raging Vulture and Lightning Angler in the Caribbean, the UFO in Toy Box, and the Chaos Carriage. All of these were fairly low, which is why it's surprising that I like Angelic Amber. It doesn't really feel like a Heartless, honestly. It does feel like a background character in the Toy Story series, just possessed and given dark powers. The actual fight isn't all that amazing, It's but it's nice to have an arena that isn't a square or a circle, instead taking place in a toy store. The Heartless she spawns are kinda interesting obstacles, but I mostly just ignore them and attack Amber herself, who has a great design. I can't really remember any of her attacks off the top of my head though, but this feels like a mid-boss in the Toy Story world. Well, stuff like the Catastrophe Chorus and Chaos Carriage could probably be plopped in any world and be Fine. The Lightning Angler too, but no other Disney World has swimmable water. Let's try another portal. Aim for the ones wrapped in shadows. The Lich is interesting because I don't actually like the boss that much, but I don't rank bosses just on the gameplay. The story and aesthetics are also very important to a good fight, and the Lich, I think, has both of those in spades. Sora breaking the laws of reality to chase after the literal Grim Reaper that captured the hearts of his friends, metal as hell. And I like how you can choose who you're saving, who you're going to save next, at least a little bit. Mickey and Kingdom of Covid and Axel and San Francisco are always last, but you can choose who to say before that, even if it's kind of hard to tell who you're going for. I think all the Guardians have a reason to be in each world too, which is nice. Aqua in the Caribbean because water, Ventus in Toy Box because of his toy Keyblade, Axel in San Francisco because it's a city, and the castle that never was has a massive city in its backyard, King Mickey in the Kingdom, Donald in Monstropolis because he's an animal, I guess, um, Riku in Olympus because that's where Sora had to go to reclaim his strength, Riku passed the Mark of Mastery so he already has that strength, and uh, Goofy and Arendelle. That's really the only one I don't get. I guess because Ice is kind of seen as a defensive thing in Kingdom Hearts. I mean, Vexen has a shield made of ice, and Goofy does do that whole shield setting thing in this world, so it's arguably the one he shines the most in, so sure. But the Lich boss itself honestly spends, spends its job just being annoying, and having to fight at like seven different times is bound to wear on you. It does mix it up sometimes, like using a water attack in the Caribbean and an ice one in Arendelle, but it's not enough to really be a different experience each time. It kind of just runs away, runs away with these harmful after images and shoots things at you, but for the sheer spectacle, I have it at 24. Oh 
the demon tide, you kinda cheated to get up this high, because I really don't like the actual fight this thing puts you through. If what happens after didn't happen, this would be below even the demon towers because both of those are better designed fights, and you get to play as Riku there, while here you just play as plain old Sora, which don't get me wrong, I prefer how Sora plays, but playing as Riku is more of a novelty. Anyway, the demon tide fight kinda sucks. It takes two forms, the snake-like form that dies into the ground and rushes at you, and this tornado-y form that shoots shadows and rushes at you. The snake form is fine, you actually fight it in Twilight Time before, but I didn't include it on this list because you don't actually need to defeat it, but the tornado form gets on my nerves. It turns red and attacks you, calms down, and repeat. And because I'm so impatient and it has so much damn health, I ended up fighting it for over 30 minutes. That is a me problem and a skill issue, but this fight was so goddamn annoying for me. Why is it so high then? almost halfway up the list actually. It's because the light of the past scene is so cool, and since you can die, I think, during the light of the past sequence, I did decide to include it as part of the fight. The actual gameplay is kind of garbage, you just match the, match the tri triangle button a bunch, but it's the context that makes it so amazing. This is an amazing way to have the mobile game players be rewarded for their hard work. Hard work. Have their gamer tags literally fly out of Sora as projectiles. I love it. Again, the demon tag kind of sucks, but the light of the past sequence doesn't, so that's something. It's just more junk. The Lump of Horror is the only boss in Monstropolis, which is a little disappointing, because Randall would have been such a cool character to fight in Disney World. Move the Lumpy Horde to the mid-boss instead of the world's final boss and I would fight Randall instead, and the Lump would have probably been in the top half, but as it stands, the last name Horror, first name Lump, is pretty fun. It's made of machinery taken from all over Monstropolis, and, it and its attacks are fairly unique. I especially like the one where it cowers and you have to attack its little hand thing. It's nice when Kingdom Hearts forces me to do something other than out than mash the X button. It also has a second form thing where it takes you to hell, and it turns out hell is full of black goop. Mike wasn't entirely correct when he called this boss junk, but he'd, he'd be even more unright if I could bludgeon this cocky ass lizard. My guess is no one's ever loved you before. Who made this guy the king of toys? Was it born into it? Did it kill the last king of toys? Is there a queen of toys? Is it actually a closeted trans girl who uses the king moniker because of her strict conservative UFO parents forced her to? I'm calling her the Queen of Toys from now on. The Queen of Toys is honestly a fairly enjoyable fight, and a huge aspect of the fight I love is the arena. Like Angelic Amber, I like fighting in, a, in unique locations, it's something KH2 should really learn from. The fight takes place in a place very befitting of the name Toy Box, and while the background is kinda just a blue sky, blue skies are pretty iconic in, on the whole for Toy Story. The different toys can bounce around and, fa and fall from either you or the Queen of Toys movements, which makes for an engaging fight as you're trying to find things to climb and attack the queen, but the layout is ever-changing. There are some instances where all the toys and blocks in the immediate area have been wiped out, so it can be kind of annoying to try and get on the queen toy queen's back, but I overall think the environment is a good addition to the battle. The spaceship doesn't really do anything except charge at you and fire projectiles, but it's fun to fight, I, and I like how you can't just air step to the weak point to take it out. You were born for these sorts of games. Unless you count Luxord's ship, this is our first boss against an organization member, or members in this case. In KH3, you fight the 13 members of the real Organization 13 in groups, and if you don't count Xehanort, we have five fights to grow through. In Remind, these fights are somewhat changed, but I'm just going to be combining the base game and Remind fights together. First on our list is three members, it's Luxord, Marluxia, and Larxene. This fight is probably the most unique of the five, since instead of having free reign, you have to attack and kill one member before attacking the other two. Every member starts off the fight on equal footing, though Luxord is very bulky at the beginning, which is good because the lad has, has as much health as the tutorial boss. M then a cutscene plays after the organization members attack you for a bit. This is something basically all the fights do, have these fake fights before the real ones get on, on the way, which I'm not a fan of. Just let me clobber these guys from the start. Stemnus is also here at the beginning of the fight, but he literally just does nothing 
nothing except create these barriers, but is very in tune with his character. He loves sitting and doing nothing. During the cutscene, Zemnus powers up Luxord or whatever the hell this is, and then cap and then Luxord captures Mickey in a card, which means you gotta save him. Luxord asks for one final game, and this game is so unbelievably easy, I'm kinda insulted. Like I've said, I love Luxord, but I'm kinda sad he got pretty shafted in these graveyard fights. You just have to run around the circular arena and hit the card with Luxord in it. And do this three or four times and he goes down. No other attacks, nothing. This is my main sticking point with this fight because I do like the rest of it. Marluxia and Larxene attack in flurries and it really feels like they're in sync, which makes sense with their synergy in both Cage 3 and Calm. All of these fights have some sort of pairing synergy, and while Larxene and Marluxia make a lot of sense together, Luxor doesn't fit at all. Luxord wasn't even in Chain of Mem Memories, which is the game Larxene and Marluxia are both most associated with. I guess all three have something to do with the ancient Keyblade legacy, and Luxord does use cards, which everyone using Chain of Memories, so it'd be fine if there wasn't a better fit for Luxord, but there is, and an even better third member for this fight, but I'll get into that in a bit. Another reason this fight is the lowest is because it was the least changed by Remind. No new playable character is just a new reaction command with Mickey. The death scenes are pretty good, Luxord's being easily my favorite, where Sora asks him to play when they're just guys, Lu which made me laugh the first time I heard it, but it's honestly pretty sweet. Luxord gives Sora a wild card as well, which no doubt will have something to do with in the future. Luxord and Marluxia's honestly aren't my favorite though. Marluxia has basically no personality in general to me, so when his death scene has him say stuff pretty, pretty much any nobody could, just thanking Sora for making him feel something, it's pretty lame, honestly. Not to mention Zemnis basically does the exact same thing, but much, much better. Larxene I actively dislike, insinuating that the only reason she's in the organization is because of Marluxia. Uh, nice work there, guys. I mean, most female characters in the series aren't handled extremely well. I'll get to Kyrie in a bit, and Xion is basically just a plot object. I love Xion, but you gotta admit the series hasn't given her a lot to do. Namine is better, and uh, Olette exists. Kingdom Heart needs needs to work on its representation a bit. So Venti Wenti wants to keep sleeping. Vanitas is the first of the true organization you actually fight before the Keyblade Graveyard, and is the only non Xehanort member to get a solo fight before Remind. Vanitas picks a fight with Aqua, and Aqua is actually the character you play as in this fight, playing basically exactly how she did in 0.2. That's my main praise for this fight, since after Vanitas gives Aqua so much trouble in Birth by Sleep, you get to absolutely destroy him in Cage 3. He basically does everything he did in Birth by Sleep, and since you fight him so much in that game, you know all his tricks. Afterward, Ven Ventus f decides to finally wake up after 11 years of snoozing, and the reunion scene is very sweet. Tara, we found you! Yeah, I wouldn't blame you if you forgot, but there's a solo Terranort fight in Remind, and it's pretty good. It's forgettable as all hell, and he basically just uses all his moves from his team up with Vanitas in the base game, but it's good. Nothing else to really say about it, though. Oh. I am worthy. Speaking of team up fights, we have our next one at number 17, Dark Riku and Zigbar. And technically Ansem for a bit there, Ansem does run away very shortly after the fight starts and like, darkens the walls with shadows? For some reason? I don't know what his goal was there, but regardless, my main negative sticking point with the Dark Riku and Zigbar fight is... Why these two? I can count the times Dark Riku and Zigbar have interacted on one finger, and I wouldn't even need any fingers to count the times Riku, Rekluga, and Zigbar have interacted, because it's not a single time. Marluxia and specifically Larxene really took advantage of Riku, R Riku, Replica, and Calm, which I'll remind you, Dark Riku is just Riku Replica, so pair Larxene with, up with Marluxia and Dark Riku, and then pair Luxord with Zigbar, which still wouldn't be perfect, the two would kind of be the outliers here, but it's like, but it's not like they have zero synergy. They're both a part of the ancient Keyblade legacy, with Ziggurat being Lushu and Z Luxord being who knows what. They're both they they both were bosses and the and the and part of the remaining members in Sora's massacre of the castle that never was. And they have that super tense scene in Remind, which honestly, God, is one of my favorite moments in the series. 
Also, they have space and time powers. That's perfect synergy there. The actual fight is pretty good. Zigbar is just chucking bullets at you while Dark Riku takes a more personal approach. It's fun, and and it doesn't have a Luxor to ruin your breakfast. The death scenes are more consistently good than the last graveyard fight, with Zigbar claiming he is worthy of a Keyblade and faking his own death, and Dark Riku being... Dark Riku's death scene. Also, side note, I've considered doing a ranking of each organization member's death cutscene in Cage 3, so let, let me know if you'd like to see that. Anyway, yeah, Riku says Riku isn't Riku, he's the real Riku, so Riku jumps out of Riku to kill Riku, carrying away Riku and telling Riku not to worry that Riku is dying after Riku tells Riku to take the replica. Riku tells Riku to give Dominate the replica, and then Riku and Riku go away, leaving only Riku. Also, you get to play as Riku in Remind, which is neat. It's the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Marshmallow might be too high, especially since there's over four, well, technically seven organization members, but four organization fights. And I'll go on, re but I'll go on record and say that Marshmallow is a great battle. It's not super mechanically deep or anything. I just like how he goes from calm to angry as hell in an instant, and it's fun to fight him, especially when he's all spiky. It's risky to attack him in his armor state because death can crawl up on you surprisingly quickly here. So do you pelt him with magic while getting in pot shots? or do you risk it all and go, go in on the offensive? In normal mode, it's not as risky. In fact, it's not risky at all, because even if he freezes you, you can usually get up and running if danger approaches. But I don't care. I just enjoy fighting a Disney character who's not a complete pushover, and the fact that you get him in your party is amazing. He's easily the biggest member we've had in the series, and his true power is shown in a boss fight that's above his own. Also, it has one of the only reaction commandy moments in Cage 3, where Sora and Goofy pelt Marshmallow with a tree. I don't know what Donald's doing all, all, during all this time. Maybe he's looking at the snow and thinking how amazing it is that it looks just like Olaf. Look out! Wow! Man, it's been a while since we've seen a Titan fight. Over 10 spots on the list, in fact. And the number 15 spot goes to one of the worst bosses in Kingdom Hearts 1, the Rock Titan. What a glow up, man. Rock Titan was one of the easiest boss fights to exist in Kingdom Hearts for a while there. And while the Cage 3 version of the Rock Titan is far from challenging, in fact, it's pretty damn easy, it's like 10 times more challenging than its Cage 1 iteration, you might actually get hit here. It makes sense to relegate him as the second boss in the game because of his legacy. The fight itself is pretty great. I love the atmosphere and hype of running up these walls to avoid spawning out of thin air rocks. The mob fight in between the two wall climbs isn't my favorite, it kind of breaks the dramatic tension, but the rest is pretty great. After running up the final wall, you attack its feet to make it fall, then attack the heads and fire at it with the mountain coaster. This is a fun gameplay loop, even if when you're directly beneath it, it feels a little awkward and cramped. The mountain coaster segment is pretty fun, and I wish attraction flow was more so handled this way, one time things to spice up a boss encounter instead of the constant thing they are. I don't hate attraction flow, by the way, but it is a flawed mechanic. He did it. He opened Kingdom Hearts. Next is Anti-Aqua, and I'm honestly surprised at how high I ranked her fight, since I'm kinda disappointed with how they handled her, but the fight itself is pretty great. The Sorrow atmosphere honestly really gets me, and it's a lot like the Phantom Aqua fights from 0.2, but kinda up to the max. Also, you play this fight again in Remind, and to my knowledge it wasn't changed at all, so I don't know what that was all about. Her attacks are fun, and it's kind of the first fight in the game that really makes you think about how to approach it, as many others in the game kind of just have you mash the attack button and dodge a bunch. But Anti-Aqua is decently tough, and I died a few times on my most recent playthrough. It's not insanely difficult or anything, I'll get to that bastard another day. But yeah, Anti-Aqua is good. Well, kinda. It is weird how they just have her transform into Anti-Aqua, and that's kinda it. No real story significance at all, though I do like the moments after the actual fight. When she thinks Destiny Island has fallen, fallen into darkness instead of thinking that she was back in the realm of light, that really shows how depressing her time in the dark world was, and is. William the Useless Fireman Dark Inferno is surprisingly similar to Anti-Aqua in terms of my general opinion on them. Super cool as an actual fight, kinda meh when looked at through a story perspective. First of all, this fight is so much fun. Learning every single one of his moves so well you could have kids with each one, headically blocking each move you need to block and dodging each one you need to dodge, it's a blast from start to finish. The Dark Inferno basically only has four moves, this flurry of sword slashes followed by an unblockable charge, a sword slash followed by 
by more sword slashes, which finishes with a downward slam, uh, aka a sword slash. This spinny unblockable move that stuns you if you get hit, and this one where he goes into the floor for a bit while dark projectiles circle around you and fire at will. He just mixes these things up in the final phases, like instead of going into the floor for some much needed floor time, he stays above ground and keeps attacking during the projectile attack, but he messes with, and he messes with the timings it's okay to strike at him at. It's constantly keeping you on your toes, but never introducing something so confusing you get blindsided on your first attempt. The part where the projectiles circle you can be a bit boring since it is just waiting for him to come back up while dodging some fairly easy to avoid fireballs. The fight is great besides that though, but that's only when you divorce it from context, because the Dark Inferno is just behind a battle gate in the Keyblade Graveyard, and it's just a random heartless enemy. It's a cool looking heartless, but at the end of the day, it's just a heartless. It's not a cool Disney fight or a Final Fantasy cameo like with the Ice Titan or Sephiroth and Cage do, or a really neat teases at upcoming games like Lingering Will or Xemnas, and in Base Cage 3, this was the only super boss, the only optional boss in general, and that's kind of disappointing. Of course, in a post-remind world, we associate a different phase with super bosses in Cage 3, but that doesn't take away from that doesn't take away how, in terms of story integration, the Dark Inferno is pretty lame. Yeah, Skull, the final boss of Arendelle, is really, really good in my opinion. In terms of story, like, yeah, it's pretty bad. Hans transforms into a wolf heartless creature, goes into a portal, and Sora and friends go inside it while the finale of the film takes place outside. Not great, but the actual fight is pretty awesome. Skull is just so intimidating. This ice wolf that can fly and has separate limbs like Rayman, count me in. It runs around the arena and swipes at you a bunch, and since its claws are so big, it's surprisingly difficult to get around them. Thankfully, Marshmallow is here and gets to portray his sheer power by helping you kill this wolf guy, and it's really the only time Marshmallow gets to shine in this world if you don't do any optional item collection or mob bot encounters. Skull also has a distinct DM move, which few bosses in Cage 3 have, but this one is awesome. Skull goes to the top of the screen and transforms into a black sun that's about to crash into Sora and friends, but these wolf and these wolf enemies start raining down. You have to defeat enough of them in the time limit to trigger reaction command with Marshmallow, and while I do wish it was a bit more clear with that, I mean like, why would killing wolf creatures allow you to hold up the sun? That doesn't make any sense, but whatever, it, it's still cool, it's really entertaining to fly around this arena trying to kill these guys as fast as you can. Marshmallow then holds up the sun, and Sora keyblades it until it shatters, which might I add, is very cool. School isn't like peak boss design or anything, but it's one of the few heartless bosses I feel like I have to approach in an interesting way in this game. Skull doesn't evoke the spirit of Hans in like any way. It sort of seems like they already designed a heartless boss for Arendelle before deciding Hans would transform into him. They can make a goatopoly. They couldn't make a goat Z. Right? Our first of the Xehanort fights. Unless you count the solo Terranort fight, of course. Armored Xehanort is the first time you fight the master in this game out of four, if you count his data fight, and is in my opinion easily the worst of the four. Spoilers for the eventual data fight ranking, I guess. Armored Xehanort is still pretty great though, but it is the most flawed in my opinion. The atmosphere and arenas here are amazing, however, especially the first and final phases, since this fight is fought in three phases, and thankfully we spawns you at the beginning of each phase instead of making you restart from scratch. The first phase is, is in this amalgamation of Scala structures that has quite a bit of verticality to it. I love this because, again, it's not just a simple square or circular arena. There's some thought to your positioning, it's actually engaging. The third, third phase has an excellent atmosphere, fighting over the crumbled streets of Scala Ed Kylum. Xehanort has some pretty neat attacks here too, like these fire pillars and literally choke slamming Sora in the third phase. The armor he wears is so cool looking, at least until you realize he's actually looking through the neck of the helmet, and now you can't unsee it. But yeah, the armor looks so demonic and badass, but fitting for Master Xehanort. But let's address the elephant in the room the second phase, which is why this fight isn't higher. It's underwater, which is fine. Underwater controls are actually pretty good in Cage 3, but for the penultimate boss to share a control scheme you probably haven't even thought about for like five hours? Eh? 
So you have to relearn the controls, and since you do, it's to not make this part super frustrating, they made this portion incredibly simple and easy. Once you relearn that you just have to block these massive flame pillars, it's super simple. But it is nice that Donald and Goofy can do something in this underwater, underwater portion, because in the final boss and third phase of this fight, they spend most of the time dead or acting as bait for Xehanort's attacks. Overall, I really like this battle, which should be obvious since it's very close to the top 10, but there's some better ones that aren't nearly as flawed. Keyblade! Keyblade Xehanort, or Kyblade Xehanort, or whatever. This is the final boss of KH3, and while I prefer it to KH1's World of Chaos, I think Xemnas in KH2 is pretty easily better than Xehanort in KH3. Now that this fight is bad, far from it, I just don't think it's nearly as epic or mechanically solid. Xehanort just kinda does slashes in the first phase, which is a little boring, especially compared to his armored fight, and even some of the wackier attacks can be a little weird, like his like the Force Rage form, it's definitely cool how Xehanort, and by proxy the Keyblade, can just drain someone's light out of them completely, but Rage Form isn't my favorite to control in all honesty, mostly because of the block, it's just really awkward to use in my opinion, and it can be pretty surprising and catch you off guard on a first playthrough, and you could up end up dying to something that's not really your fault. It is a cool sequence in my opinion though, and Master Xehanort being able to do all this stuff with just the Keyblade when he has used, had to use the armor in the previous fight when he didn't have it just shows the Keyblade's power. Like, that moment when Xehanort spawns the organization chairs and fills them with dark clones on himself is really awesome. I absolutely love the moment when Sora dies and Goofy and Donald bring him back from the death screen. That got me so hyped the first time I saw it. The scene afterward with Master Xehanort being carried away by Master Erika's is definitely a controversial one, but I personally really like it. The characters themselves don't really forgive Xehanort, and it's not like he gets to keep living or anything. He's gone forever from the series until Dark Road and Melody of Memory. But regardless, I think it's really sweet how TVA get to see Erika's again, and Xehanort's reason for doing all this makes sense in my book. I really don't understand how people can get so passionately mad about this ending, when Sora literally tells him that destroying the world and remaking it in light isn't his choice to make, and it isn't. And they stopped him from carrying out his plan, and he's gone now. He's not gonna be able to he's not gonna be able to do anything anymore. So I don't know. Kingdom Hearts is all about forgiveness, and when characters like Axel are deemed fine in the fandom's eyes, I think it's a little hypocritical that Master Xehanort can't, get at, can't at least get to see his husband again. But the fight itself is great, not the best final boss ever, but it's a great final boss to an overall great game. I'm a harmless threat! Davy Jones is next, and while I know him being above the final boss is a bit much, I think Davy Jones is one of my favorite Disney bosses in the series. It's not like the boss has incredibly deep or interesting moves or anything, but it's a fun challenge and I like the use of teleporting in his sword attacks. The Kraken even appears in a DM type move from Davy Jones where he summons it all around the ship. And speaking of the ship, this is an amazing boss arena. It's not super engaging, but there is elevation, there's some stuff in the way, and like the Kraken fight, the atmosphere seals the show. Fighting Davy Jones in torrential downpour is so sick, and it looks so good in the Caribbean's art style. I also find the cutscene after th this fight to be really funny for multiple reasons, like Sora just going ham on Davy Jones with his fists, and the way Davy Jones tumbles off the ship is honestly kinda hilarious. I know he falls that way in the film too, but it, he just absolutely tumbles into the abyss. You have got to be kidding me! If you don't count Ansem, we have the highest Heartless boss in the game at number 8. It's the Grim Guardianess, and I absolutely love this battle. This boss has so many different mechanics to it that I honestly think a lot of other bosses in the game should have followed Grim Guardianess's lead. It's got an amazing battle arena, taking place around Rapunzel's tower, and the Heartless uses this tower in many ways, like climbing up it and spawning exploding fruit above you in a very distinct DM. She spawns these walls that you need to find an effective way to weave between during the DM as well, and it truly feels like Sora and the Grim Guardianess are on the same level. They're both pulling out all the tricks they can to win. She spawns these flower things which grab you if you get too close, keeping your movement restricted until you destroy them. She has many distinct attacks like this burn move and one where she turns into an ostrich and slams her head into the ground. It's such a fun encounter to me. The main thing I will say that's negative about this fight is the story. This is supposed to be Mother Gothel and I really don't see it at all. Kingdom of 
with Hove does have a lot of plants, and honestly, I'm not really sure what else you could do here. It's not like Mother Gothel has a super unique design. Like, I don't know. But I'm sure they could have found something. Grim Garnius is honestly the highlight of Kingdom of Kobud for me, and while I'm not super high on the world in general, it does have it does end with a with a bang. One day I will set this right. Our next graveyard fight is Venetus and Terra Xehanor, and this one is mostly this high because of the story associated with it. The fight is good, Venetus is riding the weapons of dead people, you get to play as Aqua and Remind and have this sick skateboarding reaction command with Ven, Ter Terranor is doing Terranor things, and Venetus is being annoying as ever. It's fun, but the death cutscenes really make this fight in my opinion. Venetus is this pretty good, Sora breaks continuity, since he has seen Venetus' face before in Dream Drop, but I checked how he looks just like him but edgy. Venetus gets back on his bullshit about he, how he did choose Darkness, and Ventus is just sick of this guy and he just was like, whatever Venetus. I feel bad for Ventus here because like, he is getting nowhere with this guy. But the Terranort scene is what really steals the show. Terranor being, Terra being the guardian this whole time, him restating his promise as he absolutely destroys Xehanort, and the hug at the end, oh my god. This scene genuinely gives me chills. And while TVA aren't my favorite of the main trios, they probably are my least favorite if I'm being honest, this scene is so sweet and powerful and I can't help but love it to death. In Scala et Kylo. Next is the first fight you do when you enter Scala, the Replica Xehanorts. You also do this fight in Remind for some reason, but like Anti-Aqua, I don't think it's changed at all, so that's weird, but whatever. I just love how unhuman these guys are. They just float there, waiting to attack you with whatever organization member's weapon they have, but they do it in such a lifeless way that it feels like they're genuinely puppets of darkness. The fight is great, a distinct DM move that makes the sky all red and black, and this is just creepy. The contrast between the white and vibrant Scala Ed Kylum and this darkened sky is perfect. You get to run around the entirety of the first Scala area, and you can even destroy some stuff to get some health and magic, which is such an amazing attention to detail. It's really fun hectically running around this forgotten city, trying to chase down these clones. And while the fight is far from difficult, on my first playthrough it actually gave me a decent amount of trouble. The replica Xehanorts are just cool, man. I don't know what else to say. Not bad for an on-the-fly team, right? Guardians of Light vs. Replicas is such a fun bit of fan service. All these different characters interacting and making quips with each other is such a fun thing to see. The fight is ankle deep, but I can't help myself but have a dumb smile on my face when I play it. Aqua telling Axel to shut up, everyone's doing sick moves left and right, as a Kingdom Hearts fan, this is such a treat to go through. The ending part with Mickey at the end doesn't count for the purposes of this ranking since you cannot die, like, at all, but it's so... So good. Blow him away. No, I didn't forget about the last Titan fight. I really did put the Tornado Titan at number 4. The Tornado Titan is my single favorite Disney fight in the series, and I'm very unapologetic about this. This fight is genuinely incredible. I absolutely adore the atmosphere here. We're just in Tornado Titan hell, and much of the fight is spent in the air, which to me seems like a hit or miss thing, but for me, it's a massive hit. The Tornado Titan is so imposing here, and unlike the other three, it actually moves around the arena instead of keeping its feet super glued to the floor. It takes abilities from both the Lava and Ice Titan and fires ice and lava projectiles at you, it forces you to air step to block its attacks, this is all amazing stuff for a tutorial boss. It flings you into the sky and you have to fall, dodging the things that shoots from its arm things, and then smack it in the face. This part is so cinematic for me, and the music is godlike. Titanic Clash might be one of my favorite boss themes in the game, and it's also used for the crack fight. And again, this is all for a Disney boss, which usually aren't treated as very big deals in Cage 3. Only really Davy Jones can say otherwise, and that's when they even attempt to do Disney bosses. I'm not saying the Tornado Titan is my favorite Disney character or anything, but its design leads to, to an interesting encounter. Chernabog and the Ice Titan from Cage 1 and Oogie Boogie from Cage 2 are definitely up there, but the Tornado Titan is my favorite Disney boss. It's kinda cool how if you don't count the Ice Colossus, cause 
because it's not a real titan, and the rock titan because it's barely a boss fight since a single shadow is more difficult, the titans have a pretty good track records with boss fights in, Ki in Kingdom Hearts. Sorry boss, no one axes Axel. Got it memorized? Next is Saix and Xion, and technically Xemnas in the Remind fight. Similarly to Terranor and Vanitas, I prefer the story context to the actual fight, but I like the battle a lot more than the last graveyard fight on the list. The fight starts with Saix and Xion attacking you, though Xion is using Saix's Claymore, which is an interesting detail. Does that imply she can copy other organization weapons? Regardless, this part is good, but my least favorite. Though you do get to team up with Kyrie and Axel here. Xion then turns back to the light and Rox disappears after Axel gets obliterated by some Xemnas laters, lasers, and then you team up with Roxas and Xion to fight the only remaining Saix, and Xemnas was added to this part in Remind. Roxas can absolutely obliterate Saix's health bar, meaning that it might be might be boring since you can just hang back and let, let Roxas destroy this guy, but I'm perfectly fine with that. It's even better in Remind since you get to control Roxas. The cutscenes here might be my favorite. Saix and admitting that he was jealous of Axel's new friends, Axel's pseudo fourth wall break, and that hug between R.A.X. makes me tear up every time. R.A.X. is my favorite of the trios because I absolutely love Days, Days being my fourth favorite game in the series, but I also feel they got the best character development and we know them the best. Of course, I do have to knock out points for the Kyrie wrist grab, which is truly stupid, but what can you do? I also like the team up attacks between Axel, Roxas, and Xion that is amazing and gives back the points from the Kyrie wrist grab in my opinion. I don't need hearts. I will scatter them all to the winds. My favorite of the Master Xehanort fights has to go to Replica Armored Xehanort, the final boss of Remind. It's really quite simple why I love it so much, this is possibly the best Kyrie moment in the series. That isn't saying a ton in my opinion, but I actually feel they handled her pretty well here. I love how she plays and her, and her absolutely destroying this old man is just amazing. The fight itself is also great, the attacks the Replica could throw out really blow the real Xehanort out of the water. There's meteors crashing down onto the platform and creating these explosions and like this looks like an amazing action scene from a cutscene but actually playing it in game is something else sora is also here because i always play as kairi but it's really great that we get to see them team up here and have their own team attack and it's all so cinematic xehanort doesn't stand a chance against the power of friendship kingdom hearts where is my heart and finally, number one, the last graveyard fight on our list, the last fight in general, it's... You know, Kingdom Hearts 3 means a lot to me, and it kind of upsets me to see people trash on it so thoroughly, but... I'm kinda done with that mindset. I think people are allowed to dislike this game, that's fine, but can we agree on one thing? The Nort Court fight is so good. This is the culmination of everything the series stands for. The three main villains, all of whom are the same guy, fighting against Sora. And Riku and Mickey are here too, I guess. But mostly Sora. Everyone is pulling out all the stops. Anthem doesn't have a guardian, but is still able to effectively fight. Semnus is spinning around with his lightsabers, and young Xehanort is being a bastard and stopping time on you. The second Anthem SOD fight and, finals, and the final Xemnas fight in Cage 2 are some of my favorites in the series. And while young Xehanort and Dream Drop is kinda mediocre, culminating three distinct fights from the series here and upping it to the max? How could I not say that? the best fight in the game. Roxas from Kingdom Hearts 2 will always be my favorite fight in the series, but Ansem, Xemnas, and Young Xehanort's team up will forever be ingrained in my mind as Kingdom Hearts. Their death scenes are absolutely amazing. Young Xehanort decides to be Young Xehanort and mocks Sora for having the gall to save his friends. I'll go back to my time and live out my life. But Sora, you're done now. Your journey ends here. What? Goodbye, Sora. Your time in this world is... Oh. Semnus feels something for the first time in his life. Pain. He feels pain for the people who he took advantage of. And when Sora tells him that's what being a human is all about, Xemnas says... Really? 
It must take incredible strength. And Ansem tells Riku and Sora that they need to get over him, that there's more to life. What? It is time to move on, boy. There is more to seek. So go forth now and seek it. He's also telling the player this, but I didn't really listen because I'm playing Kingdom Hearts 3 even now, but whatever. This fight truly feels like the end of an era, saying goodbye to the main antagonist of every game Sora's in, finally letting them go for good. It gets me somewhat emotional, and the best part is that it's all attached to a frantic, excellent boss fight in a game that I hold dear to my heart. Well, that was the longest video I've ever made. Hopefully you enjoyed it if you made it this far in, but um, hopefully I come up with an incredibly iconic catchphrase next video, and I'm gonna go take a nap now. Bye!